And now, it's time for another Dice Tower Review with Tom Vassell. Hey folks, today I'm talking about Bruges. I'm probably mispronouncing that. I've heard so many different pronunciations. I'm just going to call it that. This is a game by Stefan Feld. Now, Stefan Feld is a very well-known designer these days, and he has done many games. And if you've watched my reviews, you know that I'm often critical of many of his games, although there have been some a very few that I've liked. Castle of Burgundy I thought was a very good game. Trajan, I hated the theming of it, but I thought it was a good game. This game was nominated for the Kenner, uh, Kenner de Spiel Award in Germany, which is, there was only three games nominated. This was one of those, so I was very interested in playing it. Unfortunately, the cards were in German, so I had to wait till they came out in English. Z-Man Games has produced it. So, the box cover is your typical, oh, look, it's, um, you know, in the Middle Ages type of uh, time frame or Renaissance time frame, and, uh, well, whatever. Is the game interesting? Let's look. the board. Now, th this is a board that has a score track around it, and players will be keeping track of their score. And there's a few other things, but the board is more of a placeholder than anything else. The game really revolves around card play. You can see here that there's two decks of cards that are going to be used in this game. The decks of cards actually have different color backs. You can see yellow, yellow, purple, yellow, brown. There's five different colors in the game, and so you don't know what's on the other side of the cards, but you do know the color of the back of these cards. Now, players are going to be trying to get the most points, as is want in these games, and so the very first thing that's going to happen on a turn is that players are going to draw cards. So players are going to draw cards from these, and you're going to draw up the five, and you can draw from either one. So I say, oh, I want a purple... Ooh, I want a yellow too, uh, I want a red now, and I'll take a blue, and I'll take a yellow. And then I look at my cards, and, and the next person draws five cards. And so we'll be doing that as the turns go by. Then, what players will be doing, one, the, whoever's the first player will roll these dice. These dice are placed here to show the values of each of these dice. Now these values have different things throughout the course of the game, but right now we're looking for values of five and six. There's one value of five, it's a blue, so each player gets a blue threat token. Now players will be collecting threat tokens throughout the game every time these fives and sixes are rolled of the different colors. If you ever get the third threat token, then something bad is going to happen to you. Maybe you'll lose workers, you know, different, different things will happen. Now here, for example, there's flooding. If you get three fires, uh, then there's a fire in your house. And the flip side actually tells you what happens. So all players will get one of these, but players have the opportunity to also get rid of these as the game progresses. Players then have the opportunity, in turn order, to move their guys on the influence track. They all start here, and they can move up slowly. This is going to be worth points at the end of the game. The cost to move up is equal to the number of ones and twos that are rolled. So there's three, so the cost would be three. So let's say yellow and red. Each decide to pay three. Green and blue pass because money is precious to them. And so that's the thing. Now it's time for card play. Starting with the first player and going around a table, each player is going to play a card and take an action with that card. However, the cards allow a variety of actions. You can discard the card and take two workers of that color. So that's a way to get these workers. There's different workers in the five different colors. You'll, you'll start with one of each, but you'll probably want more of them. Another thing you can do is you can discard the card to take the amount of money that's currently showing on the die that's on the board. Now, I doubt I would do yellow, but I might, if I had a blue card, get rid of a blue card to take five coins. You can also get, use the card to get rid of a threat token of that same color. You can also use a card to place a canal. At the beginning of the game, each player is going to put a color of their token on their castle. And their castle has a, a possibility for two canals coming out from it. So, I can build the canal in either direction, but the color needs to match. So I need to play a red card to put a canal here, and I also need to pay a coin. Now, the reason you're putting these canals out is twofold. Once you get the canal 
all the way over to here, you're going to get three points. And once it gets all the way to the end, you will take the top of a stack of statues, which is worth points. And you can get two statues if you get both your canals. So if I'm the first one to get both sides done, that's worth 13 points. Plus I've gotten three points from going in both directions as I build the canal. Back to cards, you can also play any person as a house. You just turn them over and put them in front of you. It's a house, which at the end of the game is going to be worth a point. And then, this is the biggest action, is that you can put a person, this is a fire eater, and you have to have a house to put them in. You put them in the house and you will pay the cost. This person you can see costs nine, while this gentleman here has a cost of zero. Of course, he's worth zero points. And each of these people, when you put them down, uh, they, they're worth points at the end of the game, but they also have special abilities. And sometimes, for example, this says once per round, if the brown die shows a five or a six, I can take a brown worker. And the fire eater, says whenever you play this card as a person, you may discard a threat marker of the color of that person. I get one point if I discard a marker with this effect. Each person is also a certain type of thing. You can see they're both entertainers, and that matters for specific cards in the game. Now, many of these people that you put in houses show workers on them. This conjurer here, I can spend a yellow worker to activate his action. So here, for each entertaining person in my play area, take two coins. So if I had had him, and let's say this guy was also my area, he's in a different house, then I would get four coins because I have two entertainment guys in my area. Um, this guy here, I can pay a purple worker. For each purple house in my play area, take two coins. Now those deal with money, but there are many different actions. In fact, every single card, as far as I can tell, is different. There are some that are a one-time thing action. Like here, I can spend a purple worker to draw a card. Here, I can spend a purple worker to give everybody else a threat marker. Here, as a princess, I can draw a card and do one of the actions with that card. So, the, you know, the more expensive a person is, the cooler their action usually is. But at the same time, you know, they're expensive and it's not so easy to get money in this game. Here, I can take a worker of any color with the butcher. So there are different things that I'm going to be doing. So players are going to be playing four of their five cards that they have drawn at the beginning of the turn. Then each player checks their majority tokens. If I have the, if I have the single most influence on the board at the beginning of the, each round where you pay, I flip this one over. If I have, this, if I'm, have the most people, I'll flip this one over. If I have the most canal pieces, I'll flip that one over. So there's a likelihood that you can flip over none of them over the course of the game, or multiple people can flip them over if the majority changes. At that point, the starting marker is passed to the next player, and another round begins. The game will continue until these decks of cards run out. You actually have some cards that you leave off to the side that you can draw from to finish off that round. You'll then finish off that round and you get points for all sorts of things. You get points for each house is worth a point. Some of the characters are worth end game victory points, bonuses. Each character is worth a number of points. Um, you've scored points during the course of the game. You get points for where you are on the influence track. You get points for statues, etc. Whoever has the most points is the winner. Now this game has two elements to it that I, one I hate and one I make fun of, okay? The one I hate is the negative events that happen to people. You know, I don't mind those in cooperative games because we're working together against them. Here it's like, oh, negative stuff happening. However, most of the time when those, that happens in games like, and actually in some of Feld's other games like Notre Dame, those events are, it, it feels overwhelming, it feels crushing. And here, the negative things that happen you can stop them. You really can. So if you decide not to stop them, they happen to you, well then suck it up. It's your own fault. Uh, here, I, I think they're easily stoppable. I mean, you might have to go out of your way and they're kind of annoying, but they're not as big of a deal, so they don't bother me. The thing I make fun of in Stefan Feld's games is the, what many people call victory points out. Do this, get points. Do this, get points. Do this, get points. Definitely in here. So, you know, in that essence, it's like many of his other games. But, here's the deal. Both those things are quashed by one thing that I really, really, really like, and that's the card play. I love games, this is a personal preference of mine, but I love games in which you can play a card and do many different things with it. I love games where I have a character who gives me a special power that nobody else has. And I love games that are easy to set up and quick to play, and this is one of those. 
There are multiple paths to victory. You can work on the canals. You can put out people who give you extra bonus points. You can uh, try to move the highest on the influence track. And, you know, there's different ways. You can set up an engine to get money and you have to figure out how to get the workers and stuff. But it's not complicated. I'm not sitting there going, uh. See, sometimes in these games, I sit there and go, like, okay, I need to do this, to do this, to do this, to do this. Uh, Bruges is more of a do this to get this done. And I really like that in this game. But at the same time, I feel like I'm constantly doing something different than other people. There's some interaction where you can cause other people to take negative events, um, but for the most part, you're kind of working along other people looking at what they're doing. Are they going to be the first to get to this statue? Uh, but it's saying I'm looking at myself and saying, okay, how can I set this up? To I have a guy who costs 12. He's a great, gives me points and has a great ability, but that's 12. Money's so tight. This guy's zero. He's free to play, but uh, his ability's not so great. And then, you know, which cards are you going to get? You can, there's luck of the draw. So you know you can draw a card and not ever get a character that you think is awesome, but it doesn't matter. Even if you get a bunch of characters who are not quite so good, then I, I think you can play those over the course of the game. The only time I think it matters, and this might be the only flaw I might see in the game, is on the final turn, you're drawing cards. Sometimes you have a lot of money left over and you really want to put out a character who's great and you draw a bunch of characters that aren't that good. You could argue and say you, you know you shouldn't have built up your whole game to end on that final turn, and that's possibly true. But that would be the only thing. Other than that, I love it. I have a spot here open on my shelf. I will slide it in, and it is a game I think that is worth keeping. It's a lot of fun. So you don't often hear me say this, but Stefan Feld has produced a winner. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool stuff in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.